The views expressed in the following show are of the host, the guest, and the callers. The content of the following show, its accuracy, authenticity, and the ramifications of the use or application of said content is the responsibility of those speaking and listening, not the broadcast medium. And we are, well, we're recording live. Uh, we tried to do a live broadcast via YouTube, and amazingly, even though uh, I have a huge setup here, it blocked the HD up uh, live simulcast. So we're recording this locally. It's going to be taped live, um, you know, as far as no editing and all that. And we'll be uploading, I'll be uploading it after the interview. It is out going out now live on Spreaker, so that is live audio, and it will be archived uh, as well. We have with us today James McKenney, who is, uh, he, he, he needs a large introduction to show the body of work that he has done, but to most people listening, he doesn't need an introduction because they're well familiar with his work over the years. I have first listened to James on Art Bell. And through Coast to Coast years, his website uh, has his uh, books and his writings and his uh, audio radio show he's been doing for years. And that's how I uh, have been keeping up with him. But my favorite thing to say about him is his work on both the uh, Comet Plasma Discharge model and the Weather Book are my favorites. Because the Weather Book uh, that's available, it's the first time I understand how weather works. I mean, I could literally now have a knowledge of how and why it works where when you tune into the various weather uh, channels, you know, they're saying, well, chance of this, chance of that. I can look at this, look at the uh, radar, (laughs) you know, and I can do a better job locally. I mean, and it has to do with understanding how it really works, how tornadoes work. It's all about the electricity involved. And so personally, that's my favorite thing. Though I have to say in recent years, his work with the prime numbers calculation just split open wide all of the uh, encryption that's been going on and warning about how people can break it and so on. And sure enough, after he released his book, with, within a year, all these people, websites are being broken in. It's like they knew some way about it, but with him coming up with this book explaining how it works and over, it just kind of let the whole world know what's going on. So those have been my personal Things. And, of course, the, the plasma discharge comet model is uh, legendary in uh, having NASA put up all these probes for their giant snowballs and have them all find out, hey, there's no snow there. Hey, it's kind of hot, actually. Wow, there's hydrocarbons there. Well, if they would have been reading uh, James's works, they would have known all of that. But uh, without further ado, let's bring in James McKinney. I appreciate you being here and talking with you Uh uh, and like I said in your in your work, it's uh, quite prodig- prodigious. We're actually talking to probably a future Copernicus. <laughs> I don't mean to be blowing smoke, but it's true. It's true. The work you've done has been fabulous. And welcome to the show. Well, thanks. You know, it took 300 years for Copernicus' work to become recognized by the Catholic Church, which was the uh, self-appointed curator of knowledge, in, you know, back in the Middle Ages. So are we in for another three-year hiatus <laughs> and true knowledge? Uh, well, we no. got the Internet now, and that helps a lot because this stuff can't be held back. Right. Uh, and so this stuff is leaking out all over the place. And uh, other places in the world are a little more open and honest and interested in uh, finding truth in science and work and so on. So that also helps as well. But uh, yeah, I, to add to your I, resume, I, now uh, you've come up with the wing generator, which... I will get the, well, we can show parts of the video. I want to get some pictures of it, too, that uh, is another breakthrough in, in how one can harness wind economically. It's scalable. You can make huge ones. You can make small ones. And, and they're light. They're inexpensive, uh, robust. They're portable. Uh, and yet another uh, a thing that uh, this could really, really help mankind in that uh, allow us to 
but depend on wind generation for electricity. Yeah, the wind is the best source of energy on the planet. It's uh, available, it blows day and night, North Pole, South Pole, doesn't matter. And uh, if, if you look at the circulation patterns on the globe, it's always windy someplace. And so along with the concept of deriving energy from the wind, not only did I invent something that is very efficient, something that did not exist before, but the method of distributing the energy to the end user is very important. Uh, because in a nutshell, we assume that the power company should control the voltage, a very subtle thing that nobody really thinks about. But uh, there's no reason for the central power to, company to control the voltage. And they, they actually do a terrible job of it anyway. Uh, I'm sure, James, in your studio, you have a UPS or many of them possibly to control the voltage. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the central power company is already doing a terrible job of doing what they monopolize. That's the reason they can maintain a monopoly is because they control the voltage, and it never had to be that way. The Tesla grid was designed to be a variable voltage system, and so you're already paying for that voltage control, and so why not take the voltage control out of the hands of the central power company and then now we can replace the central power company with wing generators, large-scale uh, extraction of energy from the wind and then distribute it on the grid and, uh, and then put the voltage control at the house or the business location. Yeah, I'm looking up here while we're talking. I, uh, I'm trying to uh, get some of your drawings that are coming up here. Um, this was one of the earlier sketches that I saw. Right. Uh, showing how it's scalable in its design where you could make it, uh, you know, you could have it be for a house, a, a block, a city, you know, city blocks. Uh, you could make it huge, and yet because, uh, and I we got the video, I'll run that if you want the, because uh, it does show it running, and it's, you can see it's not fast, so it's not going to slice right. birds in half. Right. Well, it's very visible also. We've we've been testing these in the field, and they, um, uh, the birds fly around them. The birds can see them. Yeah, because it's not they're not going by hugely fast, especially if you get the real tall ones. Um, let me just – I don't want to not show this. I'm just trying to uh, figure the best way to do this. I'll have, of course, links to this uh, for people to see it. It's not actually working here. Um, uh, I got your website. Okay, uh, go to my website. There we go. Click on that one. There yeah. we go. There we go. Make I'm going to go to YouTube so screen. I can get a bigger video of it. Yeah. Make it. There you Welcome go. Welcome, everybody. Now this is see James that. McCann. See if I could just fast forward to some of these things. Um, uh, go, go away at the beginning. Let the beginning play. Okay. Because you'll see an actual working model. All right. Uh, we'll just go with let that. that um, Welcome, yeah, everybody. This is James McCanny from JMCC LLC. Should I leave the audio I don't want to talk to you or? about two of no, the no, largest problems the, in the world, the energy and water. Because right. so people can go there and watch the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, what we're trying to go, get to now is I first begin with this slide talking about energy and water and all the top ten problems in the world, but they stem from energy and water. And then, um, okay. Okay, Oops, here we go. Uh, yeah, there we go. That's okay. Yeah, let it go. Okay, there we go. There's a model. That's a uh, working model of the wing generator, and you can see it spinning in a, a moderate wind. Yeah. But this is a very high torque device, and it's very solid. Okay, now there we're showing a desalination plant. Yeah, I'm going to scratch. But, um, I'm, here we go. There we go. There, there's go back there. There we go again. Is another picture. Uh, whoops. No, that's a drawing again. Yeah, let me just stop it. There here. That's... Just stop right there. We'll yeah. talk about that for a minute. And what you see here is something that nobody has figured out ever. As I sat down, I said, okay, how do we extract energy from the wind? And just to uh, go backwards in time, everybody has seen the three-blade wind generators out there across the countryside. That's stupid. The wind just blows right through them. They cannot start on their own. 
The blades on those things weigh 65 tons a piece. Uh, the infrastructure that it takes to put one of those together, and then all the equipment is up at the top, where you have to have a big crane and this massive tower to hold it all. And they're, they're also a failure because, well, I just won't even go into all the reasons. Right. But what I've got here, now, when you look at this, you see the red with the white uh, 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 cover around the outside. And this is, by the way, I have a patent on this, international patent. So I've been a busy person. A lot has gone into this b before making it public. But also you see the power head, which is a vertical shaft power head. So this is a, uh, a relatively small one. But basically when we get to the big ones, the power station is going to be down on the ground. And so the wing itself does not weigh much. It's fairly light. And it's very efficient at extracting energy from the wind. And so the big equipment is down on the ground. I mean, there's, there's so many advantages to this. It cures all the problems of the three-blade wind generator. And also uh, solar, my estimation is that solar will go the way of the dinosaur because the sun only shines a few hours of the day. So necessarily you have to store energy and that's why the uh, the power companies love solar. They're pushing people to put solar on their houses because it'll never compete with the power company. So anyway, but this will. This, when scaled up, will replace coal, nuclear, and natural gas power power plants. Now, when I, when I first saw this, I, I saw your earlier your, your drawings. And when I saw this, the first thing that hit me was how inexpensive it is to make this how light right. it is, scalable, like you said, but also what a brilliant idea using sails for the fins rather than, you know, fiberglass or what have you, uh, light, uh, collapsible. I mean, you could take it apart and easily store it if you were going to move it or, or put it on a trailer, like you said. And if you're yeah. making gigantic ones, uh, uh, what a great idea to use fabric. Yeah, no, it's a, it's very, uh, it's inexpensive, but the, the whole issue here is that it scales up. And when you scale them up, uh, they are likewise very lightweight. They're easy to manage. You can stage them from the ground, basically. You don't need uh, having cranes, et cetera, is always a help. But uh, they're very efficient. And uh, let me just give a simple example. The three-blade wind generator is a, a terrible idea. And basically, a propeller is a device, it's a physical device, that is not reversible. And so here, yeah, that's a good close-up of the wing. And the wing generator up there looking from the front side, that's the, the winds. Oh, there we go. You can see it moving. There's a little more distant picture. Uh, uh, I like but yeah. there we go. Yeah, great shot. And uh, very stable, very strong. Where, where these are located in the test system, uh, the, they get pounded. I mean, literally, the weather is extreme. And this thing is just a champ. I mean, it's out there just being in brutal weather. There's a picture from a distance on the trailer bed where this one is mounted, so they're portable. You can move them around and uh, set them up. And uh, this one, by the way, is operating some equipment that's about uh, 150 feet away. So there's uh, all kinds of advantages. The power heads are high voltage. Here's the, for example, uh, right now, this is a dump load, it's called, but it's a way of heating your house directly with wind. That's part of one of the experimental processes that I'm using. But if you had this in your house, you could have a wind generator outside or a, a large wind generator for the city, and you could heat with electricity from the wind. Mm. Beautiful idea. Mm. Uh, no, no burning coal, no uh, you know, uh, electricity from nuclear power, strictly from the wind. And here's a distance view of the wing at a moderate wind. And these things create a tremendous amount of torque. So you can run, you can uh, directly operate pumps and compressors and other machinery. Uh, and I talk about, uh, I put the picture of the jet in there because literally this is bringing in the jet age of wind energy. It's, you know, it's just 
light years ahead of anything else that's out there. You also mentioned um, desalinization using this idea. Well, Actually, uh, because you're using the wind to power it, it now becomes uh, efficient or feasible because of the you know the use of electricity for it. Yeah, desalinization, and then this is a picture of a uh, atmospheric water generator. I have picked up a line of these. I actually have two lines of this uh, product lines, and this extracts water from the air, but they're very power intensive. They take a tremendous amount of power. This one, for example, is 2,500 liters per day, the one in the picture, and it requires 43 kilowatts of power, continuous uh, power, electrical power. Mm. And so what I've done is I've, I'm in now able to operate these with the wind, bringing the cost of these. And so now in third world countries where water is a problem and energy, the marriage of these two systems brings water and energy to places. Uh, remember, three and, a half, three and a half billion with a B Three and a half billion people, a fully one half of the world population, does not have access to electricity and clean water. And so in one fell swoop, I've solved both those problems. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm trying to, there's another, you have another picture here. I'm trying to find it where uh, you were, uh, there you go. There's the, there's the uh, model of it turning. The cam, and also, cam, uh, you yeah. notice you can, Swivel it so you can turn it to optimize with the wind flow. Correct. Yeah, and there's different types. Now, this one in, we're seeing now has the full base that turns, and the one we saw before uh, has a different type of tower and uh, mechanism for mounting the wing. So there's different configurations based on the application, et cetera. Yeah. I'm kind of just... Uh, there. looping around here so this way uh you you've solved all the problems associated with it uh the cost uh the scalability the the weight of it the, the environmental uh, problems with chopping up birds and whatnot and uh, uh i've seen videos on youtube where these things catch on fire and fall down and are quite impressive but it's something that you wouldn't want to do and i i've driven next to these trucks on the road carrying these things and they're, the blades are just humongous they have yeah. to have they have to have the the actual generator that they carry out there is so heavy that they have to have trucks to have like 50 axles to be able to carry the thing and um right and they break down very readily the the problem is with the three blade wind generators uh they're very short lived in the field and so most of them and additionally <laughs> Get this, they have a motor inside to get them started. Uh, the wing generator is self-starting in a very uh, moderate wind, probably uh, under five kilometers per hour. This starts and begins generating electricity. Now, would it, uh, is there some mechanism needed to, so it doesn't spin too fast? I know some of these three blades have brakes in there to stop the thing from turning too fast. How does this work uh, in, in high, higher winds? Well, I'll tell you, that that's an interesting question because we can let these run up to extremely high RPM, and they, they work like a champ. We have ways of limiting uh, for the elect protect, protection of the electronics. But this thing, can, we've had it up into 50, 60-mile-an-hour winds, and it just runs like a champ. Doesn't affect it at all. So there's no need to break this. And, and shut it down because of high wind. It's, it starts at low wind, works through the mid-range and up into high wind speeds. And uh, l recently, we've had some in near hurricane force winds, and they're just, you know, brutal conditions. And these things are just, are, they're very well built, they're very strong and uh, lightweight, and uh, I'm I'm very impressed when I mean when you're when you're out there seeing these conditions and that thing is just taking it like a champ, it's it's amazing. Whereas the three blade wind generators, they have to shut them down. They don't work at low wind speed, and if it gets over thirty mile an hour wind, they got to break them and shut them down. Huh. Now. Um... How has the response been? I mean, I understand, like, you're not going to get a call from uh, Westinghouse 
on this, but <laughs> as, this, not. as this gets out there, I mean, how is this being received? I mean, especially from outside the U.S., other countries, uh, people who generally want to be able to generate power for their communities, uh, I think would love this idea. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunately I can't talk publicly now about the, the negotiations and the dealings that are going on okay. behind the scene. But yeah, it's it's. Uh, let me just put this put it this way: there is a sense of desperation out there now that did not did not exist a couple of years ago, and even though people knew there was a problem, uh, now there is a sense of urgency. And uh, it's from the United States, Oops. it's from foreign countries, it's from, uh, yeah, from all over the place. And let me just say, yes, there's a very intense interest in this. That's good. Yeah, it's, it's time has come. And uh, the, the, like I say, the design is patented, it's trademarked, there's a whole, all of the legal structure behind this is all set up. So... Uh, I've been a very busy person um, basically managing all this to get it into position where it is uh, stable, not only physically in the construction, but but also everything that it takes to manage this as it moves out into the public. So this particular design kind of looks like, you know, a, a, a regular table fan you would have, but as it gets up in size, it would look more like a Ferris wheel in that uh, uh, it wouldn't be rotating on an axis that could, you know, fall off. You're going to have, let's say, bearings on both sides as it turns in the middle, I would imagine, looking from some of the other well, pictures. Well, there's there's a couple ways to do this. And this one has a, you can see the tower in the back, the three posts in the back there. Right. That's, the, that's the base. And we can make those very big. Uh, we can make that structure very large. Uh, and uh, you can see now that on this picture here that the wing structure in here, instead of having the wings, we just have flat plates just to facilitate the, um, uh, the drawings. Right. But you can see that the wing generator goes all the way down to the ground. Right. <clears throat> it's not just up in the air. And so the, it's, the interesting thing here is... Uh, Let's imagine you're a kid and you went out to the playground and remember those kind of little Ferris wheels that, uh, not a Ferris wheel, but it's like a thing and everybody pushed and then you jump on and go around. Right. Uh, uh, like a merry-go-round type of thing. Yeah. And, and so if you were a little kid and you couldn't push very hard and there were big kids on there pushing really hard, then you could, uh, uh, everybody was pushing according to their own ability is my point. And mm -hmm. with the wing generator, it's the same. So you might have the wings up at the top really pulling hard because they're up in a higher wind. And then down on the side or at the bottom, they might not be pulling as hard, but they're all adding to the torque because they're all connected mm -hmm. together. You see what I'm saying? Right, right. This is one structure and it's really, really solid. So, uh, and there's a lot of cross bracing. There's a lot of uh, design that goes into making this into a very rigid structure in the wind. Yeah, and by using cloth, uh, I mean, it, it makes it a heck of a lot lighter. And then, of course, you could make it, you could use some type of light fiber carbon or tubular. Uh, there's, you know, the sky's the limit as far as the, uh, as you're playing with it. To uh, Yeah, the, 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 uh, the, the picture of the uh, red one with the white, uh, shroud this one here um, all that structure is carbon fiber mm -hmm. so it it's funny but you pick up this whole thing and it, it's like light as a feather you know it, it, so it's, it's you may not see that here you may not notice that but it's very lightweight and when the wind catches it it let me tell you the people that have seen this you know the one comment that everybody that's familiar with wind generation etc their one comment is that it doesn't make any noise. There's no vibration. There's no electrical noise. It's silent. And it's, you listen to it, you can hear the wind, you know, blowing through your ears. But this does not make any noise. And so it's a, it's a very interesting system. 
It is. It is. It. Uh, you know, here we have, we talked about some of the other things you've done, which was would be more intellectual. Let's say the Cosma plasma discharge, you know, Cosma, co- 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 <laughs> the comet plasma discharge model. That, that's the kind of an intellectual thing explaining how things work. And uh, even the weather, uh, it's, 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 in, you know, understanding things and, and so on. But this is actually a practical application that can be brought down into space-time continuums to raise the quality of life. This could be the most practical uh, of, of all your work in terms of uh, helping uh, humanity you know, on a global scale, a huge scale. Yeah, this is something that... Uh... And when you couple it with the ability to create water from the air, uh, this is a an enormous, enormous uh, step forward. So the, you know, and if you're talking about fifty percent of the world population, in ten years, this could revolutionize the the, the socioeconomic situation in the world. Yeah, because you could, uh, you know. You can go into areas. I mean, I, I remember seeing the little, looks like a coffee maker that could sit in your counter that will pull the water out of the air. I was I remember seeing those little things, and uh, it, it would take a long time to make a few quarts, and you're plugging it in the wall and all that. When you got this on this guy size being powered by its own power plant, that is uh, phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, this is... Uh... There's a lot of interest, or like we were looking at the power, the um, the resistor bank, for just creating electricity and and then changing it into heat. So you could heat houses. You know, you could have processes. You could this right here, is what I'm talking about. This is a three phase uh, resistor load, and uh, basically you could heat your house with this. This would take the place of your furnace. And uh, for storage, you could imagine building a cement room below ground off the side of your house, having this resistor bank in there, you're heating up the, the cement, and then you simply blow air with an air exchange into your house so you could have hot air heat. And uh, uh, you could heat up this cement room to a very high temperature, and uh, that's a way of storing the energy. And then when you need heat, you just open up the, the vent, and this could be done automatically, and just run the uh, warm air into the house. Or you could run these as baseboard heaters, electric baseboard mm-hmm. heaters in a house. So either way, but there's, uh, I won't say which country, but there's a country that's very interested in this because it's a colder country and uh, where they have plenty of wind. <laughs> so it's a way of... Basically, free heating, uh, you know, without burning fuel oil or natural gas or nuclear power and creating electricity. It's a way of basically heating those houses without burning high-octane inert materials. Yeah, it's interesting. This technology, this heater plus the uh, water generator is inefficient in terms of what it costs to plug it in the wall to use. You know, right, but now right. having the power coming, you know, if I could use the term almost free, you know, once the structure is built, your power is coming out of the wind, these now become uh, uh, desirable. So it's kind of like taking this, your your wind generator takes, let's call it older technology and bumps it up right up to the front of the line. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And this is just a few of the applications um, this brings all types of applications that were previously uh, hindered. And, uh, for example, let, let me bring you an example. Mining. Uh, if you have a, a mine that's underground, then typically you don't want gasoline or petroleum. Uh, their, uh, their electric bills are huge because everything has to be done with electric. They use compressed air, et cetera, because... There's a very low risk of explosion, but you can't have fumes or uh, oxygen burning down in in an underground mine. So they have a tremendous electric bill. So if you can reduce the electric bill in mining, now you can open up mines that were not feasible before. Mm. 
Let me just see if I can. I, I got. I'm looking at this to get past the uh, the little introductions here. Uh, commercials here. I got to get rid of. Here we go. I want to <laughs> go to this to, to show uh, some of the failures. How about this? Oh. One? How about this one? <laughs> It wasn't even turning. Oh. It just fell over. That's quite impressive. Ooh, ouch. Yeah, there's a YouTube is full of videos of failing three play wind generators. Yeah. Because Some of the, them are pretty, pretty important. Oh. I don't know. Is it, it going to hit the bird? I don't want I don't particularly like to see that. But uh, let me see if I got there's There's one where it was actually on fire. That was a little scary. Oh, oh no! Oh, oh no! It hit the bird! Darn it! I was trying to avoid uh, I'll that. Tell you, James, the other day I was out at one of the sites of one of the. Ooh, look at that! <laughs> <laughs> at one of the wing generation sites, the test sites. Oh, this one! I can tell you what's going to happen with this yeah, one. This, is, this why I mentioned about the speed of it because. Uh... Yeah, yeah. No, the wing generator will do that and more, and it'll, it'll just walk through it like nothing. <laughs> oh. Ooh, there's a million, two million bucks <sighs> down the hatch. Yeah, and hopefully there's no farmer walking around doing his well, field. yeah, no kidding. Getting hit by this uh, stuff. No, the, we've had the wing blowing in tremendous winds, and it just, just, look at that thing go up in flames. Well, see, now that's the other thing with the wing is all the heavy equipment is on the ground. There you have all the heavy equipment up in the air. Yeah. Ooh. You see how slow they're falling down? It's because these things are huge. These are big. Yes, they're very big. And the wing generator will be big also. Right. But, but as you as yeah, you mentioned, but, the design of it is you have the, uh, uh, you know, the system that's up in the air is 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 not, you know, it, it's not like the heavy motors and everything up in the air. It's on the ground. So. Right. Right. In the exactly. unlikely event that this would somehow dislodge, it would be quite less of a problem to repair right. and uh, and whatnot. Right. And there's other safety features, too, that on the bigger ones, we'll have breakaway sails. We'll have things like that so that if it really, I mean, uh, hurricane force winds or something like that, there's fail-safe. Um, th there's a bunch of backup fail-safe systems. I just like watching it. <laughs> well, it's that's why I say that this is bringing in the jet age of wind energy because it's uh, uh, works on the same principles as a jet engine. Right. Uh, and the, uh, by the way, it has the same simplicity as a jet engine. The uh, uh, the only moving parts on this are bearings. The only moving parts. And so it's... There's nothing to break. If you look at the three-blade wind generator, they have immense amounts of moving parts in control systems and yaw and pitch and change the blade direction and and uh, transmission that goes from low RPM to high RPM and, and just all this equipment. And so the electronics and everything that goes with the wing generator was designed for the way it works. Uh, and a, very simple. The, if you look at it, the only moving parts are bearings. Very reliable. I'm just checking to see if I... Okay. Yeah, this is... Um... Well, I mean, I really hope this uh, takes off. I mean, I know... I know uh, you... You're, you're... You're dedicated with this to help the world... And you're not holding the world hostage, uh, uh, or using political power to. Uh, you're just saying here it is, uh, and you're trying to get it out there. So I'm, I'm really hoping that it, it happens. And what you need, I think, is some uh, probably some places outside this country, frankly, to really start using this, and and that'll be the salesman for it to see, uh, uh, or perhaps. Even having some uh, industrial parks 
who uh, want to have wind power or offset some of their electricity, putting some of these up there. That'll be a nice uh, example. Well, like I said, the sense of urgency is there now. And yeah, it would be in foreign countries. It would be in, uh, you know, certain applications where it doesn't say uh, endanger the monopoly of the central power company in the United States. And so once these certain applications get underway, and remember that in a lot of places in the third world, they are desperate. They realize that they cannot continue doing what they're doing. And so once this is installed, once it's visible and people see it working, it's it's like this. It's a, it's a question of economics because now if you have a third world country that can produce a product much less expensively because energy is not a cost, is not a factor, then it, it, it creates a demand in the more developed countries to do the same thing because how are they going to compete against low, low cost energy? Most uh, most uh, industries, their biggest expense is energy. Here's another nice picture for you. Oh, <laughs> I love these. Yeah, I, sometimes I go to YouTube and just just put uh, wind wind generator failures, and you get some. Yeah, look at that. Gives you the Ooh, idea man. of the. Yes, the. This, Yeah, look at that, man. I mean, just just think about the engineering. Is it that the actual center of gravity, if you will, the weight is right up at top? All of that weight is up there, tons yeah. and tons and tons. Those blades will typically weigh 65 tons each. I've had to actually deliver uh, parts for some of these uh, with my truck. Oh, that's not pretty. <laughs> Hello. Little little problem there on the way to work, honey. Yeah. <laughs> I had this three-blade wind generator blade come through the front of my truck. Hmm. Yeah, well. Anyway, yeah, there's there's a lot of those. But uh well, I'm anyway. So, yeah, no, you know, since we have you here, uh, what do you think? What do you think? What, what you got any comments, observations, on what's going on? We have you could see my uh, uh, my uh, you could tell my point of view on some of the things going on with my uh, NRA hat. But what uh, what's your thoughts about what's going on with these shootings and whatnot? Do you have uh, something you'd like to uh, kick around here? On this? Well, if you look at the timing, the staging, these are staged events. There's no question about it. Um, there's other things going on b below the surface, and uh, that is coming out. I don't know how much we should get into that tonight. Right. Uh, but I sent you an email today that really I, I believe is going to come out in more public sense. It's not really my place to to expose all of that. Right. But a lot more is going on behind the scenes than just these shootings. Uh, and and but anyway, as far as what is visible, the the shooter in this Parkland, Florida uh, event was not arrested at the site with a gun in his hand. He was arrested at a place like what six miles away after the event. And to me, that right away smells of something that that uh, just smells of, uh, you know, rotten fish in Denmark. But if you look cumulatively at the shootings, the way they're timed, the way they're, they're set up, there's no question that there's staging going on here. Right. I mean, I... I go back to JFK you have the you have the I guess the word is patsy I don't want to call it the 
a guy who's going to be involved that is going to get blamed, and then you have the structure around him, and we see these things happening. And it it's not even how I kind of think of these things is that what is the response afterwards by the the uh, propagandists in the in 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 the deep state slash left? How do you want to call it? Right away, they call for gun control. And they say that if they don't have these weapons, this can't happen, which is ridiculous. I mean, it's like nobody gets killed in England. You know, I've had people talk about it. In England, we don't have school shootings. No, you just have people driving over people with vans, driving through crowds. You have massive knife uh, stabbings, you know, and if they, uh, it's not about whether you can get a gun legally. It's whether you can get weapons illegally, which is half the world. Uh, you know, I, the gangs I have, have story, guns. James. They don't yeah. have licensing. I, <laughs> you right. know, when you, when no, you have the, that. The, the, in the school shooting in Florida, you know, this was a no gun zone. Do you think the person with the gun is going to say, oh, well, this is not a, this is a no a gun free zone? And right. they, no, they walk in. So the, the only person with the gun is the shooter. And so it's a, it's a killing field. It's a slaughter zone for the innocent people who are not, who have no protection. Uh, but I have a, a bit of a, a commentary. I was in um, South America when the Paris shooting was going on. Remember the restaurant shootings? Yeah. And uh, just a second, I have to... Um, there was a story that aired on international TV in South America. And when the Paris shootings happened, uh, this never made it to the United States media. But it was a small restaurant in Paris, and these guys came up with submachine guns or, you know, AK-47s, whatever, to this restaurant and, you know, with, the, with them drawn, and they were going to start to shoot. Well, there were three... Medellin cartel drug dealers in this restaurant in Paris who were packing heat. And they summarily pushed over their table and shot the three guys who were coming in with the AR-15s or AK-47s. It never made it to the news, but it made it to the news in other countries. That never was shown in the United States, which tells you these are done for effect. This is not about, you know, and there was a perfect example of people who were armed and basically defended that entire restaurant, and it was over before it even started. Right. And at church where the, they were mowing down people, and a guy came in with his AR-15 and shot the guy stopping him from murdering more people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the the logic here. Uh, I was on a radio show uh, last Friday, and uh, we were talking about this. And I brought up the point that every year, 2,500 high school students across the country are killed in automobile accidents. 250,000 high school students are entered into intensive care hospitals because of automobile accidents. Shouldn't we be worried about automobiles? How about drownings are the largest cause of juvenile death in the United States? Should we prevent kids from going around swimming pools? Uh, you know, where's the logic that, uh, you know, if, if we're interested in protecting kids, then should we take away skateboards? Should we take away surfboards? Uh, you know, what would, should we be doing in the entire purpose of the Second Amendment which they're clamoring about, and of course, that's what this is. It's an attack on the Second Amendment. The entire purpose of that, I, I heard, uh, uh, what's his name? Is it James Shapiro, or what's his name? Ben. Uh, first name. Ben. Ben Shapiro. And he was saying, do you want me to give you my gun? And the policeman that went to the sheriff's deputies that went to this stood outside, and they're the only ones that are supposed to have guns, and they didn't go in and protect these people? And you want me to give you away my give away my guns? Uh, the guns are for self protection and more so for prevention of a uh, protection against a, a tyrannical government. This right. is not about hunting. This is not about uh, uh, you know have, who can have what type of gun or not. 
the system completely failed the people of Florida because this kid, if he in fact is the one that did the shooting, and there are questions coming out, now did he actually do this? Because they didn't catch him doing it. There is no videos of him doing this. There's no, if you call it smoking gun, literally, there is no smoking gun in this case. And, uh, you know, how exactly, is, it's kind of like when they arrested Lee Harvey Oswald. He was across town in the theater, and they walk in, they go, there's the guy right there. Wait a minute. Yeah, and then I, you know, I, I had a show uh, this past su uh, Sunday where I uh, played video from uh, Good Morning America where a teacher was describing she opened a door and she was 20 feet from the shooter who was shooting down the hallway in spurts. And she described him as having a helmet, a uh, bulletproof vest, all dressed in black, fatigues. She called it full metal garb. And he was shooting down the hallway with a gun she didn't recognize. And I'm like, wait. And, and, and they just went over that like nothing. Like, oh, okay. And then what about the kids? Yeah, the kids are upset. I'm like, wait a minute. There was nothing found at the scene. There was no uh, garb that was retrieved. And the guns that he had were standard guns. And I'm thinking, like, whoa, right in plain sight here, we got ourselves a huge deal. The story didn't add up. And, yeah, you mentioned uh, about the uh, you mentioned about the tyrannical governments, and somebody had posted this on Facebook. You have Stalin took away guns and then murdered 5.4 million. Mao Zedong took away guns in 35 and murdered 20 million. You know, Hitler took away guns, murdered 13. Pol Pot took away guns in 76, murdered 2 million. So, uh, and you know, and I wrote something on Facebook, and, and I said, you know, people think it can't happen here. Because they're like, no, that was back then, this is different, we're more modern or whatever. But it's the same neo-Bolshevik, neo-Maoist type stuff, only it's American style. When you hear these people talking about these things, it's the same deal. It's a, it is the same purpose. And, um, you know, that's why it's, it's just, we, it, we can't, it can't let it happen. No, it, it's not going to happen. And uh, the more they do this, uh, you know, the more they exhibit the staged, uh, like this one, very clearly staged. And uh, if you look at other ones, there were a lot more, a lot uh, different elements. This one, they actually shot people and killed people yeah. and wounded people. This was not a faked event. Uh, there were actual, you know, uh, body count and went to the hospital. But the outrage, the other issue is that now, now they're playing off the high school students who don't have experience. Right. This, is, this is one of the things, and of course, there's a lot of emotion in, in any of these issues. And a lot of people today don't deal with guns at all. Uh, a lot of people, especially in probably Parkland, Florida, it's probably one of the places where there are fewer guns per capita in the high, uh, you know, the upper middle class housing. There's probably uh, most of these houses, you might guess, have no guns at all. And the kids were not brought up with guns around them. Um, we, as kids, all my friends had guns in their house. Uh, they got guns when they were kids. We had gun training. And it would seem to make sense if they're going to have driver's education for kids so that and, and they're going out and killing themselves in far greater numbers, then wouldn't it make sense to have gun training for the kids who wanted it? And I have, you know, I, I was going to try and scroll through Facebook. I probably, and I don't want to waste time doing it, but I had uh, some people sent me pictures Newspaper clippings from the 50s, where I, I'm looking while we're talking here, where they had uh, kids would bring their gun to school on a bus with ammunition so that they went to gun club and uh, during uh, during school hours where they'd have shooting right on the campus and no one ever got shot. Well, if you're taught as a kid how to be responsible, uh, all my friends had guns, all of the, my friends' families had guns. And we did not have problems, you know, and we learned how to respect them. I had uh, training. We took it very seriously. And, uh, you know, so 
it was it was uh, part of the culture. So it wasn't like somebody was going into a school and shooting it up. It just it never happened. But why is this going on now? Well, uh, there's some other issues with the failure of the schools. On my paid cast, which I uh, just completed for March 1st, it was dealing with education. And so let me explain just a rudimentary, uh, being an engineer, if, if you were going to define an educational environment and, uh, and put it together today from scratch, in an engineering sense, what you would do is you would write a functional specification. You'd say, what is this supposed to do? What is education supposed to do? What's the end result? What are we going to put into it? And what do we want the students to come out of this with? Well, the only thing they can get right now is reading, writing, and arithmetic. And these are tools. This is like a hammer for a carpenter. That's not the end game. The end game is educating the students, understanding the Constitution, the history of the United States, the history of the world. But they don't teach that. And unfortunately, what I find in the schools is a bunch of namby-pamby, goody-two-shoes stuff that has nothing to do with the real world. These kids, you know, they're, they're great kids, but they're, they're not being taught how the world spins and who are the political pay players. Uh, I know a lot of families, uh, their students listen to my radio shows. They read my books. And I'm, uh, as a person, I was very tough on myself as a kid, studying and uh, progressing and, and trying to understand how the world worked. But uh, believe me, I didn't get it in school. I had to go outside of school to get that. But so in that sense, the schools are a complete total failure. They're not preparing students for life. They're not teaching them the rules of the road. In fact, most of the teachers have no clue themselves how the world spins and who's in control and who's creating the dialogue and that they're following it like blind sheep and then they're teaching the kids. Here, I'll, and, I'll show you what the teachers are teaching the kids. Let me turn up your monitor so you can hear what she's going to say. It's a teacher shooting a water gun or a whatever at then candidate Donald Trump yelling die. This is what the teachers are teaching. Well, obviously, she is a, uh, a you know, uh, an extreme example, but, you how you know, how, how long should this teacher have been employed after that? Ten minutes? Oh, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, l let me tell you something, James. Uh, there is a narrative in this country, and it seems to imply that the majority of people are, first of all, anti-Trump, and that they're... Uh, uh, anti-gun, pro-destroy the uh, Second Am Amendment, which, by the way, goes along with the First Amendment, the freedom of speech, etc. But uh, I did an, an analysis after the election, and what I found was, first of all, there was massive cheating. About 17 million votes went for Hillary Clinton that weren't supposed to be there. But... <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but if you looked ar around the states and you went down to the county level, which I did, there was like 93 to 7 or 89 to 11. This was the vote swing with Trump winning. <clears throat> so w what you found were only 10 places in the United States where Hillary Clinton won votes. And those were what I call cheating centers because they had more votes in these locations than they had voters. Yeah. Los Angeles, Chicago, um, Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, etc. Yeah, let me go to this. It's, there's another picture for you. If we make guns illegal, then no one will ever get shot. That's how we stopped everybody from doing drugs. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. But um, the so let me just explain something. 
about 93% of the United States is very much in favor of what Trump is doing. And, so, and those are the numbers. So when you find the, the mainstream media, which represents an extremely small portion of the United States with extremely being extremely vocal, what we have is a situation where it appears that an extremely small minority of people have, have a, a majority, and that's simply not the case. All right, and the media allows you to believe that with the way that they're doing it. But, you know, I, I just got stopped uh, the other day. I was in uh, the food store. Here, let me see if I can grab it for you here. I was wearing my uh, riding jacket. I was just walking in the store, and some guy came up to me. Let's see if I can hold it upright. I'm not doing it too well. I got to do it backwards. No, we're not, not we seeing go. it. Uh, you see I got the 9-11 uh, is an inside job underneath uh, the yellow patch there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Well, right. I'm just walking in the store. I don't know what's, I forget what's on my back. You know, that's my jacket. Some guy came up and said, he goes, yeah, 9 11 inside job. You know, I'm starting to wonder about stuff. And then at Fort Florida, I'm wondering about that stuff. So, you know, there's just a regular guy. He's thinking, you know, it's starting, the wheels are turning and people are starting to become aware of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really true. And I see that too. And that's little old ladies, it's men, it's, it's kids. Uh, and, the country is waking up because, you know, it just smells wrong. It just looks wrong. And the mainstream media, in spite of their uh, being very vocal, nobody's watching it anymore. You know, the, the uh, uh, you know, MSNBC and CNN and, you know, the New York Times is dying on the vine, the Washington Post. These news outlets, which were big before, have no, nobody's watching them. And it's a sign, and, and so this event in Florida gave them fuel. Let's just put it that way. Right. It, it just threw gasoline on their little fire. Well, here's here's some of the uh, fire that happened. I posted this, and I was kind of surprised on people haven't, I thought it would be like wildfire across everywhere, but uh, somebody sent this to me. And I posted it. It is uh, HR fifty eighty seven. It is a assault weapons ban that's been been introduced into Congress. This is the uh, federal assault weapons ban, and it uh, has to do with the bump stocks and all this other time high magazines and all this stuff. And that's that's up for legislation. Now, I, I don't even if this passed, I don't think it will because of the vo they don't have all the votes. But even if it did, I can't see this passing through uh, Supreme Court, you know, and yet they're, right. they're still trying anyway. Right, yeah, but uh, there again, there's a lot of political leverage coming off of this. There's a lot of people who are going to try and make it into a political issue at these, the upcoming midterm election, and and that's the point. It's, it's a way of disrupting, you know, look at all the other issues that are on the table regarding what's going on in politics. So to concentrate on one, obviously they're targeting certain candidates. And uh, so this is a political thing. If you, if you don't think that the Florida shooting was politically motivated, then you, sh you should uh, take your head out of wherever it is. <laughs> Please. Yeah. I mean, it's a, put it this way, at least, you know, to take the most conservative approach of it, I don't mean politically, I meant like it's at least being used. Right for political. I mean, at, at least we can, you know. I mean, at at the very least, well, you know, uh, it's it's be obviously being used, and the uh, David Hogg and and these guys are obviously being used by the propaganda media, uh, which probably he hopes to be able to join one day. And uh, so they're going along with this, and I, I just po I posted a tweet that uh, he did. And I responded to it. Uh, let me go back to my webpage thing here. This is what he wrote. I know that the NRA owns you, Mark Rubio, Donald Trump, and uh, Governor Scott. But, I mean, come on. Why is it so hard for you guys to rip off your shock collar the NRA has on you? Because, at this point, y'all are like a bunch of really stupid sharks that think you have power. 
you know, so uh, I wrote my, my little response to him uh, was, I guess you're fixing to be owned by CNN, Mr. Hogg. Because, you know, he's doing, he's playing their bidding. Mm-hmm. I got to go get back to where I was now. Yeah, so uh, it, 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 you know, it's obviously being used uh, politically. And I, I want, you know, and I, I called the NRA. I, I, I decided to up my membership, even though it wasn't due, just to make a point, you know, kind of like to statistically make a point. And it didn't, uh, it didn't come up on my website. And I called them the other day, and she said that this is on Monday. No, Tuesday I called them. And she said that we won't be able to access our membership computers until next week because we are so overwhelmed and backlogged with people joining and re-upping their memberships that we have to actually, like, I, we, they're shutting it down from our end so that they can catch up. That's how many people are responding on there. So I was really encouraged by that. And I put well, that out the, as a tweet. That, that, that was my point, my description, where uh, the vast majority of American people are fully aware of what's going on. This is not fooling them. And this, if anything, it's it's building up a lot more support for the Second Amendment. Because uh, as soon as you see that the sheriff deputies did not go in, they stood down, do you think that they were under orders? Obviously, these guys work for somebody. They're not there doing this because, oh, it, it was a bad day, hair day and it just didn't feel like going into this school that day. No. These guys were under orders to stand down. And if you don't think that's true, then you don't know how the sheriff department works. It's, it's a top-down, uh, you know, and the, these people have orders uh, and training to, uh, conf- uh, uh, for uh, situations like this where they have to go in. They were told to stand down. There's mm-hmm. no question about this. And so uh, when other police were there, there were, in fact, I've seen other interviews with policemen who were told to stand outside waiting for the gunman to leave. And that's why nobody, no gunmen were, were arrested or shot. Nobody saw anybody doing the shooting. You know, we don't have any police officers who saw anybody doing any shooting. There's no smoking gun in this. And, you know, they immediately come out and say it was this kid. Well, wait a minute. He was arrested six miles away. He didn't have a gun in his hand. There was no indication he did anything. Mm. There's, you know, in in a true court scenario, they did not come in and find him standing there shooting guns at students. Plus, you're right about the stand down, because if you were a police officer on the scene and you did not go in and try to do something, you would be reprimanded for not doing your job. But if you're being told to stand down, you would be reprimanded. And in the aftermath of this, nobody was reprimanded. No. Because so they were following orders. And, uh, you right. know, now there's got to be guys in that group who didn't like this a lot, got them sick to their stomach because they're really there to help protect people. And those people are really going to have to deal with their conscience on this one uh, to see how they could still uh, stay there knowing that they're basically being political pawns as well. I, I mean, I, I, I'd hate to be them. Well, when the Coral Police got there, uh, from my understanding, it was pretty much all over. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, how did they identify this kid as being the shooter? And they go to this place, kind of like the Lee Harvey Artswell deal. You know, he's in a theater across town. Uh, oh, there's the guy there. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know? Um, well, well, based upon the, his uh, YouTube and his social stuff, they already had picked him be the guy right you know that's why well, kind of no it. question about that psychopathic SWAT team guys who did the killing they left discreetly left the uh people who were on the scene uh there were some sheriffs on the scene because they that's another thing i said this on facebook too i said how many just statistically speaking how many schools in the united states were personally trained by the secret service and how to deal with school shootings and bombings and whatnot, weeks prior to this, and then actually have the event happen 
people thinking it's still a drill because the drills were just happening within days ago, or somebody even said that day they had one. I mean, what are the odds of that happening? Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, there's so many of these logical scenarios you could run that are just too hard to swallow because we want it to be, no, our government is nice, you know, and so on. You you have to face the facts on it. That's where, you know, Socrates came in. They ended up killing him or, well, sentencing him to death because they kept getting pissed off that he didn't tell them what they wanted to hear, and he used critical thinking to actually uh, address the issues. And and the same's happening now. People are getting thrown off YouTube, Facebook, uh, uh, being uh, they're being deleted. I have a I had a reoccurring guest on my show for years, Doctor Reed Louise, had an interview with James Fetzer. It's been up for a year. It disappeared for community standards. It's already been out for a year on her website mm-hmm. because Fetzer is one of those names that are being censored. So everything with him in it's being pulled. So it yeah, uh, the, it's big wake up time, the, folks. Wake up time. Whether you like these people or not, I'm not. You know, Alex Jones has got his third strike, and they're uh, deleting his uh, his YouTube channel. You know, I mean, say what you want, but this guy has uh, been bringing out a lot of information. And so, I mean, you know, the old saying, if they can take him down, they can take anybody else down. Well, yeah, but the, the you know, there's other means, there's other methods. Um and uh, I've, I've told people of my fans uh, that I said, you have to get a shortwave radio because there might come a day that that's the only method you have of listening. You know, because the, the radio is a free broadcast, and, uh, the, but the Internet is very controlled. See, uh, there was a time when they wanted to shut down the Internet, but it became an extremely useful tool for the people in, in the upper echelons of what you call deep state or whatever. So they decided to leave it, but it has become a problem because of all of the, uh, you know, the, the, the embusioning uh, industry of, uh, of uh, media that is critical in analyzing what's going on. But in terms of the Florida shooting, the police did not arrest this kid at the site. There was no smoking gun. And if if you look at any court case, whether it's, you know, whether it's drug trafficking or homicide or anything else, the when you get down to the facts of the issue, then you know the the it's based on evidence. There's no evidence that this kid did anything. There is no hard evidence. And people go, ah, well, he did it. Well, you listened to the news, and you were convinced it was put into your mind that this kid did it, and now everybody's walking around saying this kid did it. But when you look at it critically, there's no smoking gun. They did not catch him shooting in this school. Right, and, you know, it's just like with the with the Pentagon uh, and, uh, being hit in 9-11, there was like what well, I don't know. Was it fifty cameras who should have ca- caught the shooting, uh, the plane hitting it? All those cameras didn't catch it, and uh, they have cameras in schools everywhere. There should be cameras of of it happening. Well, there's nothing being shown. There's no. Uh, and I mentioned there's an eyewitness saying about the garb, and there's no garb being provided. <clears throat> you go back to these other shootings. There was talk of two shooters. They even had, right. they even arrested one in fatigues in a t-shirt, fatigue pants. Uh, brought him out on a camera, and then the guy disappears. No one met, nobody asks about him anymore, and nothing. I mean, it's it it you 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 have to look at these anomalies. It's it's the when you have contradicting evidence, that is going to be what points you in the right direction. Not the stuff that lines up. It's the stuff that doesn't line up. Is what you have to look at because that's the one that's saying ah. What about this? Well, uh, James, the other thing here is that there's never any investigation into uh, the mind control programs. And what's clear is that people, if you go back to, you know, there's the whole laundry list of things that have happened in the United States. 
the mind control programs that control what we call sleepers, people that are out there. And I guarantee you, we know that since the 1950s, the CIA has had mind control programs in the United States. And who do they pick on? The weak, the people who are out of the norm of society, and especially these students, you know, or people with problems. And so their computers are taken. Nobody does any an, 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 uh, analysis. And to associate these shootings as one coherent activity, mm. this is not done. The law enforcement, I mean, if you look at the investigations, every investigation is completely flubbed. Uh, it turns out that Governor Scott of Florida, who I really don't like at all, I think he's a, one of the biggest patsies, uh, controlled people. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. But he did send down an independent group of people to take over the investigation from Sheriff Israel. Because it was, uh, basically, they weren't doing an investigation. They were just glossing it over. And, uh, uh, you know, this was uh, another point uh, that Ben Shapiro made, is that uh, this sheriff got up and blamed the NRA gun rights, Second Amendment, when he, in fact, had his sheriff deputies on site who did not go in and stop this. And that only came out days later. Mm -hmm. That's but, when we found that out. Yeah, I'd like the, to say uh, all Coral these Springs police, all these shootings that have been happening, Columbine to Sandy Hook and all that. How many of these individuals were NRA members? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the funny part about this is these people. What they had in common, all of them, is they were all on some psychotropic drugs. You right. know, so if you want to start drawing some commonality here. These people were either on or recently on or recently quit drugs that on the warning label warned you one of the side effects are homicidal thoughts. So talk about a big red flag. Right. No one's talking about control of that stuff. You can get that like candy from your doctor. Right. Right. And, and there again, that's a, a you know, it's, it's not the gun. It's the person who's holding the gun. So if you're giving them drugs and then allow them to have guns, the, the police had been to this kid's house 39 times because of violent behavior. Do you, don't you think that that uh, when you go to your doctor's appointment, the doctor goes, do you have any guns in your house? You know, mm. and, and, and do, you, do you think after going 39 times to this kid's house, they would think to ask that question? Well, that's why I think what they did was they they were they found a nice guy to pin, pin it on. I mean, he's got all the right. paperwork behind him. But right. then, it, because because they found a good patsy, the thought process. I mean, they're they're not they're smart, but they're not smart. Is that well, wait a minute? In those thirty nine times, why didn't we take the guns away or process this in this individual? So now, by picking their perfect patsy, they're also pointing out their own failure. As well, exactly, so. exactly. Yeah, I think a lot more is going to come out on this. And uh, that email I sent to you today, uh, I think it's best not to talk about this right now. I'll just say one thing. I'll, I'll say this uh, for people who are interested in following this up: look at the YouTube videos of a guy named Timothy uh, Holmseth, H O L M S E T H, and follow the go down that rabbit hole. And I think what you're going to find, uh, you judge for yourself. Would you spell that again? Oh, it's there it Timothy, is. Timothy. Holmseth, okay. And then H, yeah, H-O-L-M-S-E-T-H, -E Timothy. Right. And uh, And look at the various uh, commentary from him and from uh, other people who've uh, looked into this. But uh, anyway, uh, more will come out on this very soon because... Some things happened in just the last day that I can't personally confirm relative to him. And uh, anyway, okay. all I can say is go check that out. Okay. We will do that. Uh, I, I'll put that in the, in the notes below for people watching this at a uh, future time. Uh, anything you'd like to add in here before we uh, call it a day here? 
Well, it, it turns out the, the, the thing that I can't confirm but apparently is true is that he was arrested in Florida in Parkland uh, by a woman who, well, anyway, you, and, and so anyway, apparently he's in jail right now. Timothy? In, in Florida, yeah. Okay. And, and uh, so anyway, so it's, it's a complicated story, but like I say, I, I can't personally confirm any of that. Right. But just follow that. Uh, there's not a lot on him, but uh, follow that because that what you're going to find is the uh, an entire layer that is beneath the Sandy Hook and the Parkland shooting and uh, the high school shootings. And there's something else that's far more nefarious and grievous going on b behind the scenes. I'll just put it that way. I just noticed that the Alex Jones channel still exists. I don't know if it's going to get pulled tomorrow, uh, but they have over 2 million views. So I don't know if they changed their mind. Maybe pressure got to them or if it's still on its way out. But I just happened to notice that it was in the, it was in the uh, side here from this Timothy individual and uh, so i just thought i'd uh bring it well you know it's mm. always great to talk to you james mckenney we have the website J you know right there james uh, jm jmckenneyscience.com it's right there you can do it i'll have the links below as well and we'll, you know we'll keep in touch and, and when you do have something you'd like to share on these various things we can always do just a quickie 10 minutes you know whatever it takes to get it out there plus you have your radio show that people can follow as well on your website and about 3 million tons of information that you have on there. Uh, so Yeah, uh, the, the website is pretty extensive, and I, I have what I call my paid cast now. I encourage people to join that. It's $3.95 a month. But I do a, a every week a deep dive into uh, topics. And, in fact, this week my topic was on education. It's part of an ongoing series. And uh, so anyway, the, encourage people to do that because uh, my and then I have my work weekly commercial free radio show that's been going on for 17 years. And uh, so both of those very available there and uh, everything else that goes with it. And the books and I mentioned off camera, I drink in water here that has been filtered with your James McKinney filters. <laughs> <laughs> About time I, I changed those too because it's been a while. So you got uh, not only do you have the information, but certain products that uh, you have your research and stamp of approval on there. So uh, it's really a lot to deal with. So anyway, I appreciate you being here, and we'll keep in touch. And uh, until next time, be safe. I'll try to be. This is a crazy world we're living in, and uh, but, but I, I see some positive things. I think that uh, the. I think the Parkland shooting is symptomatic of a group of people who are on their way out. They're desperate. They're doing desperate things. And uh, the, the victims are truly victims, but of something that they're not aware of. And that's, the, uh, that's I hope, the education that we ultimately get across to these people and the parents and, uh, you know, the absolute tragedy here. But they're going to find out it's not just at the hands of some lunatic kid. This is a there's much bigger, much larger picture going on here. Boy, and if that that gets out enough, uh, and and as I've mentioned, the, the the dark side of this equation can't afford to lose this battle. I mean, they're they're battling not only for their power, but if the people knew what was going on behind the scenes. I mean, I had a friend of mine that I knew briefly from Bulgaria. And he said that once Bulgaria went into a democracy, that uh, people weren't happy with what was going on. So they actually went to the Capitol, 100,000 people went to the Capitol. They dragged out the senators and beat them in the streets. And they all mm -hmm. resigned, and they had new elections. I'm going like, wow, now that's democracy. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's I mean, voting. something ever got out this horrible that people really got it. Uh, you know, all our differences are going to disappear, and mm -hmm. we would unite uh, against this real uh, cause. So this is why they're fighting so hard, because it's it's to their death, uh, literally, I guess. Anyway, all right, I appreciate you being here, and we will keep in touch. And um, thank you. Thanks, James. Thanks, everybody, and 
Um, just keep moving forward. Will do.